continue in our series called Lead. And uh, we're in part three right now. But uh, I want to first state that we teach this course very humbly. Um, it took us a long time to step up to teach anything on leadership because we just, we are so not the people who say we know it all with, when it comes to leadership in any way, shape, or form. Um, we are just grateful to be used however God can use us. So what we're doing, we're not saying we're all that in a bag of chips with leadership. What we're just saying is that God has shown us some things, and we want to share with you what we believe the heart of God is in the realm of leadership. So I just want to clarify that. But um, today we're going to delve a little deeper into um, some things, and, and we're going to finish it up over the uh, next week to get a little bit deeper into it, but we want to talk about the difference between positional leadership and godly leadership. We talked week one about um, how leadership is not about a position or a title. It is about what? Influence, right? It is about influence. So sometimes leadership comes with a position, sometimes it comes with a title, but more than anything else, it is about influence, and so we want to share what that is. We talked a little bit about this positional leadership and what is it. What is it? It's like military style where you have told what to do, and you just have to do it. Now, if you've got a one, two, or three-year-old, or even under five-year-old, do it because I told you to do it. Do it because I said, see, you guys have done this too. I'm not the only one in this. What have we done? We've given specific instructions, do this, don't do this, do this, don't do that, and that works great at a bottom level of leadership. How many people know if you try doing that with your 13 or 15 or 17-year-old, you might hear some reverb? <laughs> Just me and my family, I guess. <laughs> your kids never talk back to you. They're in the background. I love when my dad says no. It's so amazing. All right, I'll slip out of the delusional, Bill. Do your kids always like when you give them instructions? Come on, people. Me and five people here. Let's get real. Do your kids enjoy when you give them instructions and it's something they don't want to do? They don't usually tiptoe around. Brrr, slam the door goes. Come on, people. But that's the bottom end of leadership. You're just doing and telling them. Now, they don't understand the big picture. They don't understand why you're telling them, no, they can't go hang out with their friends that are driving illegally without a driver's license and racing down the streets with their mom and dad's car while they're out of town. Come on, somebody. Sounds like fun, but how many people, parents, know that that may not be a good idea and end the right way? You see, positional leadership uses, usually uses fear and manipulation, Right? Like, if you don't do this job properly, you'll lose your job. Right? And it is a valid thing, but that is the tool and the, the reasoning they use and the way they use the fear to make, motivate you forward. As opposed to getting someone to, to do a job because, wow, look at the impact you'll make. Look how much better this this. Um, thing would be with your contribution to it. It's a very different thing. And the thing is, if you continue, like he was sharing, with um, a positional style of leadership in your home, the day will come when your kids will not want anything to do with you because they want more. Because, you see, you and I were designed for so much more than just base-level positional leadership. And I'll say, you know, when, when he's saying, you know, do it because I said so, right? You know, how many of us, May, none of you guys, maybe I'm the only one, but have said to your children, man, I, took, I brought you into this world and I would, could take you out. That's about the time the fathers are grabbing the kids and running for the back door. <laughs> right? Oh, those moments. But the thing nobody is, gets that upset around here. Honey. Nobody, nobody, because I know all of our children are perfect, but... Um, Anyhow, the thing is, I think many times what we do is we gravitate. It is that type of, of leadership where we're forcing, where we're forcing our will, where we're commanding, where we're demanding. That is the lowest form of leadership, but it is the easy default, okay? It is the 
easiest form of leadership because it doesn't take any creativity. It doesn't take any discernment. It doesn't take any stretching, thinking of a new way to do this. It's easy just to blow up and make them do what you have to do, right? With your kids, if you don't know how to handle the situation, it's just because I said so, right? But how much better if we can learn a greater level of leadership? How much greater as a boss? How much greater as a, a family? How much greater in a ministry or anything else if we can actually learn to get better so it doesn't have to default to that level of the lowest form of do it because I said so, right? And that can take on all different kinds of things. And we'll talk some more about this. But, um, but God is not one, or here, <clears throat> I'm sorry. Positional leadership demands respect. Godly re- leadership earns respect. You see, there's a difference. I want to earn respect. I want people to follow because they want to be part of what I'm doing, not because I'm making them because they're scared to not follow. You see, there is something that we can do in our families that your children want to be with you because you have earned their respect. Your employees want to fulfill the vision of your company because you have earned their respect and not just demanded it. You know, one of the things is God never forces us to follow him. He asks us, for God so loved the world, the Bible says that he gave his only son. Did he know that you were going to ever love him back? Have you ever loved somebody and they never loved you back that's really like short and one-sided and it really doesn't go anywhere quickly? Well, that's what God did for us. He said, you know what, I'm going to make a decision. In fact, before the foundations of the earth were laid in place, I knew you were going to be here at this point in time and I've already determined I'm going to love you and try to help you in your life. Whether you're going to follow him, whether you're going to have nothing to do with him, whether or not, he still made that decision. And he didn't say, and by the way, if you don't do it. Because we read through scriptures and it says, if you're willing and obedient, then you'll eat the good of the land. It, it, the Bible also, in all those promises, God says, if you faithfully and diligently see what I have in the scriptures here and follow it, you'll have all those great success. Well, what if you don't follow it? You don't see God in the background saying, you idiot. I can't believe you can't get your stuff together. You missed it. I can't blah, 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 blah. Watch how they talk. God never does that. See, God's just made that decision. He's going to step out and give you an opportunity to increase and make your life better, but he will never force you. He'll never put a gun to your head and say, this is what you have to do. So he gives us an opportunity to respond to what he's doing in our lives. You know, um, one of the things that is very dangerous about positional leadership is it creates a competitive type atmosphere. And you kind of go, well, comp- competition is good. And there is a healthy amount of competition that is good. But then there's a kind of competition that is not good where people will not thrive. And I want to look at James 3, verse 16. And I like this in the Amplified because it really expands on this. It says, for wherever there is jealousy, envy, and contention rivalry and selfish ambition, there will also be confusion, unrest, disharmony, and rebellion, and all sorts of evil and vile practices. Wow, all sorts of evil and vile practices. Man, does it make you want to package it up and take it home with you? Right? Yeah, let's just bring evil and vile things into our home, right? Let's bring it into our business. Woo! But the problem is, aren't we seeing a lot of that in our community? in our our country, in our world, in our culture? Why? Because we have relied too much on the world's model of leadership, which is positional. And we see it everywhere, right? And and there is is a, a, a positional structure that has to be in place for there to be order. I get that. But it is the heart of those people in those positions that makes all the difference. If you are using that position to lord it over people, it's a problem. If you're using that position to serve people and to love people, it's a good thing. But when when we get into this place of being positional with everything, and it's our title, and it's who we are, and you have to do this, we end up in chaos, right? It, it ends up being the total wrong spirit that is released into our culture, and where there's division and all these kinds of things. Could you just imagine right now if every politician and every employer decided to switch 
their form of leadership to a godly form of leadership. And we started just looking at God's way instead of positional, instead of it being about competition and all these things. You know, one of the cool things with God, he calls a, a relationship with him part of the family, yeah. doesn't he? Now, do you have a CEO in the family? No, you got a mom and a dad. You don't have CEOs. And so we've gone to conferences, Pastor Joy and I, and all of a sudden they said, well, aren't you the CEO? Well, there's some business stuff in the church, and there's a lot of it that you got to run. So, yes, it's good to have a good administrative head to do that. But what's a CEO trying to do? Stay on top all the time, aren't they? Come on, go, go with me on this. They want to be the top dog all the time. Do you know who I am? <laughs> Let me just explain. I'm the El Presidente. I'm the big cheese. I'm the big this. I'm the... So what happens is they're constantly inflating their position to say who they are. Where if you have a family type of situation with a mom and a dad and it's a healthy environment, you want to see your kids succeed and do well. You're not competing against them. In fact, when they do good, you're just excited. You're cheering them on. You're like, come on, you can do it. You can go to the next. Why? Because you have a different mentality. I had somebody come to the VIP room several months back, and they said, I want you to know something. When you preach, you're like, here. But when Pastor John preaches, our, he's our, 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 um, our working family with pastor. the couple, family pastor. He said, here. I said, praise God. When's he available next? Come on, somebody. <laughs> Why am I not intimidated? Because if you surround yourself with great people in a family, you're not competing. You're cheering each other on. See, when a mom and dad, that's why God says it's the family of God because when somebody's hurting in a family, the family doesn't say, well, I'm the CEO, so I'm not going to bend down and deal with that. No, if you're the parent, you're going to come in and say, hey, listen, let me bring some nurturing, some healing, some protection. Does that sound, sound like a family? Because that's what a family's supposed to do. So we have family that, that, that something happened in... Pittsburgh and bad things happen and somebody went in and shot up a synagogue and so what do we do as a family? We get together and we pray. God, protect them. Lord, be with them. We'll, what, what else can we do? I don't know if we know some people in the area. Maybe we can make some calls and try to help out some way. See, what does the family do? They, they get behind and they, they protect. So we as a mom and dad in this church, we want to see you guys flourish. We want to see your businesses explode. We want to see your marriages go to the next level. We want to see your, your relationship with your kids thrive. Why? Because that's what parents do. They want to see that happen. It breaks my heart because I, I run into people nowadays and they say, well, I had my dad. I had a good relationship. And then he came in and he stole everything I had because I trusted him. I, I have a mental breakdown. I'm like, what? What parent would go after their kids to hurt their children like that? Sadly, it happens today. See, well, I had the privilege years back to learn from the Jewish people. Come on, they, they, they would pour into me. I'd ask them questions. So tell me how this works. How does that, how, how can you do? Why? Because I was the adopted kid, and all of us are adopted kids, but we came from the roots of a Jewish family. Our father is, is, is Jewish. Come on, somebody. Jesus is king of the Jews, thank you, and you're an adopted one. But we have this identity crisis because we don't understand how this family is supposed to work. And he said, let me tell you, he says, when you see the two-year-olds running around, they're not just little rugrats. Watch this. They're future doctors. Come on. They're future attorneys. They're future accountants. They're future business owners. What's going on? A little different perspective, isn't it? And the parents are building them up. And the grandparents are behind there doing more to help them. Had one of the grandparents came to me and he, he said this to me. One of them was a good friend of mine. He just passed away a couple of weeks ago and it hurt because I miss him. I, and when he was buying more property, I said, Harvey, what are you doing? His name was Harvey. I said, you don't need any more. You got enough going on. He says, I want to make sure my great-grandkids make it. Come on, people. 
See, what is he doing? He says, I will use whatever sphere of influence I have to promote my kids, my grandkids, my great-grandkids. I want to see them go to the next level. I want to, come on, I'm going to get behind and, and push up. That's the family. That's how God is with you. See, God didn't show up and say, well, here, you really know who I am? Watch Jesus show up on the scene. People ought to be serving me if they just knew who I was. I mean, I did create the earth. I did speak it into existence. I did make you. I did this. Come on. He could have been all that puffed up, but the Bible says, no, he got down on his hands and knees and started loving on people that didn't, nobody loved. Started serving people that nobody wanted to serve. Why? Because he came in and he started showing himself in a powerful way. You see, positional leaders can always be replaced, Right? A mom and dad cannot. And that's where if we can start seeing this differently in that family context of leadership as opposed to a positional style. Um, a positional leader will constantly have to have their value affirmed by their title or their position. It's like, the, have you ever heard, do you know who I am? I'm the president of this. Or do you know who I am? I am this and I'm that. And they get their self-worth from the title or the position or how much they get paid or whatever else that is. That is a positional style of leadership where you, you are threatened by anyone who comes up that could replace you. And that is no way to live. That is not a good feeling to always be in that place of, man, what if I lose my job? What if I lose my position? What if people don't value me anymore? Right? Who wants to live that way? Godly leadership, though, godly leadership is confident and what God has put in you and your self-worth comes not from who you are or what your position is or anything else, but who God says you are. It doesn't matter what people think. It doesn't matter if, okay, you know what? I used to be the CEO and now I'm not anymore. Guess what? Your value isn't in your position. It's in who he created you to be. That way, if everybody else speaks against you, if they come at you and say, man, you're worthless in that, you shouldn't be that, whatever else, it, it doesn't matter. You know, when we started, we were sharing this at the VIP room between services with somebody, but they were talking about women in leadership and as a pastor. And let me tell you, in our first few years of pastoring, I, I was hit so much for being a female pastor. It's like, man, you shouldn't be up there. You shouldn't be doing that, whatever else. And just misunderstanding what Scripture says. Because Scripture, just for the record, massively affirms women in ministry. Okay? It's all through, through Scripture, Old and New Testament. But, but I took hits. But here's the thing. The position of being a pastor meant nothing to me because I didn't ask for this position. God put me here. So when I understand that God's put a calling on me, I don't care what you call me. Call me pastor, call me pastor's wife, call me Joanne, whatever. That's not where I get my value. I get my value in the fact that God has a calling on my life and I'm going to fulfill it. Okay? And that's where he wants you to be. He doesn't want you to have your value in, oh, good, I finally got to be a leader of a team. I finally got to be a leader of a ministry. I finally got to be a boss. I finally, that's not where your value should be. Your value should be in God. What have you called me to do in this position? What have you called me to do? And that's where your worth is. That way, if you lose your job, it doesn't matter. You still have worth because you know what God's called you to do. And he's just going to open up another door. You see, it's a total game changer when you start realizing that your worth cannot be in your title or position. Your worth is already established by the purposes of God inside of you and who he says you are. You see... It's such a higher calling of leadership. But we want to talk about what is godly leadership. We've talked about positional. Godly leadership is something called servant leadership. Say servant leadership. Servant leadership. Okay. So to me, when I put these two words together, servant and leader, in the natural thinking and in the world's way of thinking, those are opposites, aren't they? Right? Like someone, a servant you know, you think of someone who comes in and serves a household, um, you know, um, who, who does the cleaning or the cooking or whatever else. And then there's the leader who is, you know, the big honcho in charge. And how can those two possibly coincide? Because it just doesn't make sense. But we've got to understand that God has a way of doing things that is hidden from our natural way of thinking, right? It, the Bible says, trust not in your own understanding, but trust in him, right? And so even in our, 
you know, in our tithes and in our offerings. How does it make sense that we give money away, yet somehow he blesses us more in return? That doesn't make sense, but yet it's God's hidden way of blessing his children. It's the same in the realm of leadership. How does it make sense to be a servant leader and rise up into my calling and my destiny and my purpose? How can I be a better leader by being a servant? So we want to talk about that now, and we're going to read in, um, Mark we're, going 10, at, we're going to look at Jesus' style of leadership. It says, then James and John, the sons of Zebedee. How many people would like to have a name like Zebedee? Honey, we blew it. We had four boys. We could have done we it. We have a child they, dedication yeah, later. They can maybe change the name there. <laughs> uh, they came over to speak to him. Teacher, they said, we want you to do us a favor. What is your request? He asked. He replied, when you sit on your glorious throne, we want to sit in places of honor next to you, one on your right and on the other on your left. Then Jesus said to them, you don't know what you're asking. Are you able to drink? from the bitter cup, of, bitter cup of suffering I am about to drink? And are you able to be baptized in the baptiz baptism of suffering I must be baptized with? Oh, yeah, no problem. They, they say, we are able. Then Jesus told them, you will indeed drink from the bitter cup and be baptized with my baptism of suffering. But I have no right to say who will sit on my right or on my left, God has prepared those places for the ones he has chosen. When the ten disciples heard what James and John were asking, they were indignant. They were a little upset. So Jesus called them together and said, You know that the rulers of this world will lord it over their people. The officials flaunt their authority over those under them. But among you, it will be different. Everybody say different. Difference. Whoever wants to be a leader among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be the first among you must be a slave of everyone else. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve others and to give his life as a ransom for many. So here's just a really interesting, beautiful portrayal of what we're talking about. These, these disciples, and all of them are guilty of this, okay? They all were looking at position. They didn't yet have this revelation that Jesus was trying to demonstrate something else. They were going with the common denominator, right? Like our first instinct is leadership is position. Leadership is, man, if I want to be important, I have to have that position of being on your right hand or on your left hand. I have to be that. And then what did we just talk about how um, positional leadership causes competition and unhealthy things, right? Rivalry. Well, then what happens? All the other disciples are like, whoa, what? Like, really? Like, no, how dare you ask for it? I want it. You know, that whole thing. Like, how dare you do that? But Jesus just does something that's absolutely amazing. And he gives us this, this paradox thing, this, this thinking that's completely different. And says, guys, you got it wrong. If you want to be a leader, you got to serve. It's like, what? Right? Like, what? You've got to serve. And he gives us this whole other model. And we've got to understand that, that Jesus is trying to step us into something. He's Because we are no longer slaves. I love this. A slave is required to serve. A slave is in bondage. A servant gets to choose to serve. You see, and we get to be servants where we get to choose to serve the purposes of God, where we get to choose to serve people, because in that there is something even greater we get to step into. We get to step into a realm of, of the calling of God on our lives. We will only see pr true promotion, okay, because positional promotion, you can get that by manipulating everything else, but it will not be lasting. If you want influential, godly promotion, it will come through serving how crazy is that, right? The first will be the last, and the last will be first. And it's this crazy thing. So one of the but things is... I, I just want to mention this. Okay? Yeah, please. Okay. Um, in the King James Version, there is... It's very interesting. The word leader, you would think... Like, there are so many, so many amazing leaders in the Bible, wouldn't you say? Yes. Godly leaders. They are all over the place. You would think the Bible would be full of the word leader, right? It's not. There's only six times it's mentioned. 
But do you know how many times servant is mentioned? Hundreds and hundreds of times. So we've got to get this mind shift into something completely different from trying to get a leadership position to instead actually aspiring to the opposite. Don't aspire for the position. Aspire to serve. How crazy is that? But yet that's how God starts working and how he'll start bringing you into your purpose. You know, so let's go on a practical level with this because if if we're in a family and in a healthy family there's a mom and a dad... And if you're in a situation that doesn't have that, we're not here to shoot things at you, but I I want you to see a picture of how God wanted it done. Okay, so he says to the man, you're going to be the head of the house. So if you don't understand servant leadership, you can get yourself into a lot of trouble. Because try that with the wife. How long is that going to last? Before your fingers are missing, your arm is like a stump. Come on. (laughs) How about the kids? Doesn't work very well, does it? So here's what God says. uh, As husbands of the house, you're going to be the head of the house. I'm going to put you in charge. In other words, you're going to take the first blows that come through, but you're going to be able to get down and serve those kids. So if if they're late for school and they don't know how to tie their shoes and they're four or five years old, you're going to get down and teach them either how to tie them or tie them quickly. You're going to look for ways to make sure that that your wife's doing well. You're going to look for ways to make sure that the house is functioning, that you're financially providing for the family the best of your ability. You're going to be looking for ways to protect your home so that your kids are... No, no, no. See, that's, the, that, that's what God calls the head. He, he was the head of the church and, and he served. Are you seeing this picture? So what does the head mean? It means that you get down and you serve and you look for ways to be a blessing and help other help out your family so that your family thrives. You haven't even gone to work yet, people. That your day job is just what you do. It's not who you are. It's real quiet in here. So you're doing everything you can to be a blessing to them, to lift them up. To, to if they're sick, get them what they need. If they need medicine, get them some there. If they need this, come on. I, one of the things I noticed, I said to my wife several times, I said. Being a dad is the worst paying job I've ever had. Come on. Being the head, <laughs> being the head of, it's a lot of work. And then some, one of the kids doesn't agree with you. Come on, somebody. <laughs> Keep smiling. Because I know if you've got kids, they've done the same thing to you. I don't like that breakfast. Not our children. I'll just redeem our children. <laughs> How do you, what does a servant do? Come on, people. This is the real world. Because we get this fantasy, oh, well, bless the Lord. It's good. No, this is you working it out. You are getting down and you're figuring out how to be a servant. When God says you're the head, that means really you're going to be the one doing all the work behind the scenes to make sure it's happening. Are you getting that? It's not my kids only knew who I really was. <laughs> That's funny. We were just out the other day, and my kids are really quick to point out my shortcomings. Are you with me? <laughs> I'm kind of looking at them and smiling. I'm thinking, just wait till your kids get up. Come on, son. <laughs> Anyhow, let's get back In to In love, of course. Let's, you know. let's get back. Um, so I, I just want to give some illustrations in a practical sense of how does this look. Okay, someone who is, um, we have a a church culture here where we require serving, and we require a servant heart um, because we understand that this is the godly model. So we have a culture where people want to serve, where if you want leadership, you've got to be willing to serve, you know. This is not positional. You don't, um, our, our staff are there not to be served, but they are to serve, our teams, and our volunteers. Um, They understand that. So there's some things that we, I'm going to give you some sentences because they are red flags to us, and I think you could probably relate it to whatever your situation is. But um, one of the things of a positional leader, they will come in and say, here are my talents. What position can you give me? And we get this a lot. Walk in. Hey, I do this and this. Where, you know, where can you, what position can you give me? What 
you know, what place of promotion can I have? I, I just want to come in and I want to be a leader somewhere. Versus, here are my gifts and talents. How can I serve you with them? Do you see the difference? One is, hey, here are my gifts and talents. How, what position can you give me? Which is all about position. It has nothing to do with people. It's about what you can get out of it. The other is, here are my gifts and talents. How can I serve you? How can I be a blessing? How can I let God use me in this situation to make things better? Do you see the difference? Um, the other thing is, um, a, a positional leader will always say, hey, that's not my job. <laughs> like, I'm, I'm, I'm the leader of that area. I don't do that. A servant leader will always say, um, whatever needs done, I'll do. Whatever needs done, I'll do. It's not about position. It's not about that's not my job description. You know, in your workplace, I guarantee you, I mean, we, we own companies. We have employees. Someone who comes in and says, hey, what do you need help with? And you ask for something. If they say, oh, well, that's not my job. And they're just going to sit and wait. <laughs> it's not going to go over very well. But someone who comes in and out of their job description, something you ask, is, man, I just really need help with this. Hey, let me help you with that. Man, I live in that person's going to go someplace. You know, if we just start, I love, he, you made a, a comment the other day um, about how someone, many people go to work, you know, in, in some of the, like let's say a, a job is $10 an hour, they go to work for $10 an hour, and other people just go to work, right? And, and the point is, sometimes we limit ourselves, we only give what we think they deserve, instead of serving and giving everything that we have in us. Because when we serve, when we come with a servant's heart, it's not about what they deserve or what they earn from us. It's about how can I make this better? How can I serve this company? How can I be the best I can be um, in order to, to bring this? It's a great ahead. story. There's a great um, uh, uh, person by the name of Christine Kane. You've probably heard her before. She runs the A21. Uh, they, they, they really help people with human traffic all around the world. All over it's the a world. big, big operation. She was invited to the White House several times and given all sorts of awards and everything and so she's a real big deal everybody say big deal, big deal. but she says that she said this we had the privilege of meeting her at one of the conferences and she said but when i go home to my home church she says i just do whatever they need to help me done so she says if i i gotta help in the kids area and wipe some dirty bums come on she says that's what i do if i gotta clean the the, the bathrooms that that's what i do well, wait a minute. I, I thought you were the big deal. Come on, somebody. She says, when I come home, back to my home church, she says, I come to serve. And see, that's a, posi that's a place where, where, where Jesus was doing the same thing. Every time he got around, he would look for opportunities to serve others. Get down on his hands and knees and wash some dirty feet of some disciples. Are you kidding me? If you only knew who he was. But yet, that's where his heart was. was you see, we serve. didn't start in leadership. We've served, I think, um, in probably every place there is to serve in ministry. <laughs> you know, we've been in kids' ministry. We've cleaned the grossest bathrooms you could ever imagine. And boy, we have some memories, don't we, Kim? <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it, wherever it's needed, you do it. And God sees that heart. If nobody else sees it, God sees it. And that's where it comes from. We'll talk about that in a couple of weeks. But the question is, are you, guys, are you serving? Or are you waiting to be served? Um, because there is something um, powerful when we start realizing we need to be serving. You know, I want to go back to the scripture we read. And it says, Jesus asked, are you willing to drink the cup? And, you know, with leadership comes great sacrifice and pain. It, it's not easy. It's never or it, it's rarely convenient or comfortable to start serving. It rarely ever is. It rarely ever is, but it's because the reward is so great. If you could just start serving people, if you could just start serving, you would find reward on the other side of that like you've never imagined. There is so much to be, um, to be gained if we could simply learn to serve. You know, um, I think one of the biggest things we have to realize is that we have to stop being people wanting to be served and instead switch to we realize our calling is to serve. Now, when we are supposed to be, we are made in the image of, 
of, of God, right? Yes. Right? Okay. Yes. Just breathe, everybody. It's okay. It's okay. Just, okay. We're in his image. And if Jesus was, came to serve, that means you and I were created to serve. It means you and I were never created to sit and just take it in, take it in, take it in, and not serve back. We were never created. We will never fulfill our full destiny. We will never fulfill the plan of God in our life. We will never have contentment in our life. We will never have full peace in our life until you learn that it is not enough to sit in a church and let, you know, keep receiving, 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 and let people serve me um, without serving. If we don't serve, we will never be all that God has called you to be. There is a restlessness inside of you. There is a discontent that, that just sits there. And you kind of go, well, I don't know what this is. I just feel a void in my life. I guarantee you that you will, if you do not serve people, if you do not serve the purposes of God, and I'm not, I'm not talking just about a church. I'm talking about people being godly, serving people. If we don't do that, there will always be a void in us because we were created to serve. So one of the things in serving is wherever you're planted, do it. We have great, peop great people in the church here that just have taken on different things that are not even inside the church. And some of them have gone into their communities where they're in apartments, and they said, and also they became the party planner, and so they, they said, well, just get people together and have fun, and come on, and, t and tell them about church, and tell them about God, and build some community. So that's what they're doing. And now people are coming to church with them. Come on, people. This is kind of cool. We have others that have just decided they were going to go and cook, grab meat and stuff from, the, from here and, 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 and just cook up some food and stuff and go feed the homeless. How many people think that might be God too? Do you think God would do that kind of stuff? Yeah, I do. And others were just going to, as, as the lady spoke, she goes to the jails and just loves on these people. Right in this book. Why is she doing this? You, you've never seen somebody so fulfilled in your life until you meet her. Why is she doing that? For the money? No. For the glory? Absolutely not. Why? Because that's what God's call in her life is. How many people are going to get set free because of her obedience? Amen. How many people are going to get set free when you and I get obedient? I want to invite you to close your eyes and bow your heads if you're here today. And we'll give you an opportunity to make sure your life is right with God. So if you're here today and you say, man, Pastor, I've, I don't have a relationship with this God that you're talking about, but I, I really feel that something's been pulling on my heart and I need to do it. So whether you're here or on the online campus, I want you to know that God specifically has you here for a purpose. You're not here by mistake. God wants to give you an opportunity to invite him into your life. Or maybe you're here and you say, Pastor, I did that one time, but I've really kind of fallen away. Here's a great opportunity to hit the button. It says reset. I want to bring my life back with God. So the Bible says this. If you speak with your mouth, believe in your heart, and ask Jesus to come into your life, your life will radically change. So I want to pray this prayer, and I want to invite everybody to pray it with me. And as you say it out loud, we're not going to single you out. We won't make you raise your hand. We won't make you stand up. This is between you and God. Online, I want you to say this out loud with me too. It goes like this. Father, in Jesus' name. Father, in Jesus' name. I ask that you'd forgive me. I ask that you forgive me. Come into my life. Come into my life. Be my Lord. Be my Lord. Be my Savior. Be my Savior. Help me to live for you. Help me to live for you. Every day of my life. Every day of my life. In Jesus' name I pray. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.